morning. Welcome to Greater Vision Baptist Church. Find your song books with me and turn to song number 116. Song number 116. It's good to see everyone this morning. We're going to sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Song number 116. Let's stand together and sing it on the first. Help me out on the first now as we sing it. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God assist me to morning. Welcome to Greater Vision Baptist Church. I'm just so glad you're here on such a beautiful day today. What a blessing it is to be in the house of God with friends and family and people who love the Lord. I can't wait to get into the message. I haven't preached for a couple of weeks and it's killing me. And so I'm looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us. Hey, hey, I just got to say what a great God we serve. It was such a great revival we had this week. It was just amazing. The altars were full every night. Uh, the music was wonderful. The preaching was just exactly what we needed, wasn't it? Amen. It was such a blessing. Amen. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do as a result of this conference that we had. Why don't we stop and ask God to bless our time together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this special day. Thank you for these special people. Lord, thank you for the work that you want to accomplish in our hearts. And Lord, we come on purpose. And we yield ourselves to you, expecting you to do a work that only you can do. Thank you for our visitors who are here today. What a blessing it is. And Lord, I pray they would be very aware of the love that's in this room. Love from you and love from the people who are here. God, please. Thank you for allowing us to serve you. And Lord, I thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. And God, I'm asking God that if there's anyone here who does not have forgiveness of sin, they don't know where they're going to spend eternity. I pray today would be the day they would realize that they need a Savior and that his name is Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you bless us. May you receive the glory today, Father. We ask all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. All right. Find song number, one, uh, song number 98. We just sang about, well, the last song was, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. We have much to sing about, amen? We have a great Redeemer. Song number 98, far, far away in heathen darkness dwelling. Song number 98, go ye into all the world. All power is given unto me. Help me out on this song. Sing it together. Far, far away in heathen darkness dwelling. Millions of souls forever may be lost. Oh, who will go? Salvation story telling, looking to Jesus, minding not the cross. All power is given unto me. All power is given unto me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with. Christ, arise and enter in. Christians, 
nations awake, your forces all uniting, send forth the gospel, break the chains of sin. All power is given unto me, all power is given unto me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you. of God is calling. Why will ye die? Re-echo in his name. Jesus has died to save from death appalling. Life and salvation therefore go proclaim. All power is given unto me. All power is given unto me. Into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you always. God speed the day when those of every nation, glory to God, triumphantly shall sing. Ransom redeemed, rejoicing in salvation, shout hallelujah for the Lord is King. All power is given unto me, all power is given unto me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you. Away. All right, and continuing on to song number 340, song number 340. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me from condemnation. He hath made me free. Aren't you grateful for that this morning? And it gives us that reason to sing song number 340. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Let's sing it together. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son, saith he, hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. Believeth on the Son, tis true, of everlasting life. All my iniquities on him were laid, all my indebtedness by him was paid. All who believe on him, the Lord has said, of everlasting life. Verily, to you, verily, verily, message ever new, he that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting life. Though poor and needy, I can trust my Lord, though weak and sinful, I believe his word. Glad message, every child of God, of everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son is true, of everlasting life. On the last now. Though all unworthy, yet I will not doubt. For him that cometh, he will not pass out. He that believeth, though the good news shout, hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. Believeth on the Son is true, of everlasting life. Amen. Thank you, Britain. I appreciate that.
that. Amen. Let me give you a couple of announcements. Don't forget, 4.30 today, we're having a revival prayer meeting. I'm so grateful for the work God's been doing. I'm grateful for the cottage prayer meetings we had. I'm grateful for the Sunday afternoon prayer meetings that we have. So I'd like you to join me this Sunday afternoon at 4.30. And then don't forget, come back tonight at 5 o'clock. I'm starting a new series in the book of Galatians tonight. And I know you'll love it. Uh, Galatians is such a meaty book, and we need some meat. And uh, I do think that our churches don't challenge our people enough with meat. I think we have too much milk, and we need some meat. So come on back tonight, and you'll get some meat at 5 o'clock tonight. I think it'll be a blessing. Um, there is no ladies' Bible study on Tuesday. I've got another appointment I need to be at. So there is no ladies' Bible study for Tuesday. But there is Saturday for the men at 8 o'clock at Chick-fil-A. We had a great time this Saturday. Come back and join us this coming Saturday. We're in the book of First Timothy, chapter number 3, and we're having just a wonderful time. We started our new Sunday school class today for 20 to 40-year-olds upstairs. We started, we had 16 folks, and we had good food, and we had good fellowship around the Word of God. It was just great. I loved it. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do through that Sunday school class. That'll be a blessing. Our semi-annual churchyard sale is scheduled for April 26th to 27th. You'll be able to bring items to the church starting right now. Until Thursday, April 25th, the proceeds will go towards our missions trip to Michigan. I'll be talking about that missions trip in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm very excited about that. A lot of behind-the-scenes work is going on for that. And I've got a lot of folks who are interested, so we'll be talking about that more. There's a men's paintball activity Saturday, April 27th, because you know, you got to kill something, right? The cost is $33 per person. Uh, we'll leave the church at 930 and head to Bowling Green. This activity is for ages 13 and up. Ages 13 and up, please see Brother Britton with any questions. Uh, maybe we might be able to work around that age limit. I'm not sure exactly, but Brother Britton would know there's probably some liability issues I don't know about. How many of you fellas and young men would be interested in doing something like that? Raise your hand. Amen. Look at you. I know you're the ones I need to watch out for. Okay. Amen. That's good. Good. Praise the Lord. That'll be a blessing. We're, we're so glad to have visitors today. We're just grateful that you can be here. Forrest and Carrie have a friend. We've got some, a couple visiting with us. We have a young lady visiting with us. I met her two years ago. Two years ago. She was out riding her bike. And she looked hot, and I gave her a bottle of water. Two years ago. And she told me two years ago, she said, I'll come to your church. And here she is. Isn't that a blessing? Praise the Lord. See, you never know what a bottle of water does. And that's a blessing. But I'm glad you're here. We're the Greater Vision Baptist Church, and we want to be the friendliest church known to man. Help me with that this morning. Let's stand together. Let's be friendly. Let's shake some hands. And it's not like you had her address anymore.
All right, join me in that chorus. It's song number 233 in your books. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Sing that with me now. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary's tree. From sin and set me free, someday he's coming back. Oh, what glory that will be. His love to me. All right, 472 in your hymnals, song number 472. Sing them more again to me, wonderful words of life. All right, let's sing that together now. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, teach me faith and beauty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that we have the ability to come and worship you here at church. We ask that you just bless the service this morning, be with pastors, he gives your word, and bless the offering. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen. That was a blessing. Amen. Second Corinthians in your Bibles. Second Corinthians. We've been working through the book of Second Corinthians, but we've taken some detours, getting ready for a revival. I, we took a month off, and we talked about the home for a while, about issues in the home. I always love talking about the home and the, uh, the, the family and what we can do for the next generation. And I'm grateful, though, we're back in 2 Corinthians. I love 2 Corinthians. I'm very grateful. By the way, I, I hope, how many of you got a blessing out of this last week? You got a blessing out of this last week. I, tonight, we're going to talk about that. I, I'd like to hear about that. I would. And just to see what God's been doing in your heart and in your life. And I just think it's so important. 2 Corinthians 3. Now listen, we're going to start at verse number 12. But I'm going to read all the way to chapter 4, verse number 6. 2 Corinthians 3, 12, and we'll read all the way through chapter 4, verse number 6. The Word of God says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Therefore... Seeing we, have, as we, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost." in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commended the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. Amen. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. So here's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Now I see. Now I see. Can I ask you a question? How many of you sitting here this morning, you know, you know you, your sins are forgiven. You know you're on your way to heaven. Raise your hand. You know that. You're not ashamed of that. Amen. God bless you. Can I say that's a wonderful thing? We're going to talk about that this morning. Pray with me, would you? Father, we come to you and we desperately need your help. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a lot of folks dealing with a lot of things this morning. And Lord, I think one of those things is the burden that's on their heart for uh, friends and for loved ones who, who don't know that heaven's their home. Lord, would you speak to us this morning? Encourage us, even challenge us today, Lord, please, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, have you ever talked to someone about Christ, but they didn't see it? You ever talked to someone about Christ and it was obvious they weren't getting it at all? Maybe you talked to them and it was definitely clear that they understood, but that's as far as it went. They would not make a decision for Christ they were not willing to trust him for their forgiveness of their sin and for their eternal salvation. You, you know how it goes. So as a result of that, you tend to get frustrated about the whole situation. Why won't they just say yes and trust Christ? Don't they want forgiveness of sin? Don't they want eternity with Christ in heaven? Don't they want to be free from the bondage? I believe this passage has an answer to that. And we want to talk about that this morning. Number one, unbelievers are spiritually blind. Unbelievers are spiritually blind. 
this is a two-pronged issue. Let me, let me talk about that. Number one, they have a veil over their eyes. They have a veil over their eyes. Look at chapter 3. Look at verse number 14. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. Uh, don't lose your place here. Go back to Exodus chapter number 3. I think I'm wrong there. I think I'm going to tell you the wrong place. That's not the right place. Let me just tell you the story. I wrote the wrong reference down, and I apologize for that. In the Old Testament, you know the story. Moses is up on the mount with God. And as he's spending that time with the Lord, his whole countenance is changing. To the extent that when he came down off the mountain, he needed a veil over his face because the people could not look at him. As he spent time with the Lord, his countenance changed. He came down off the mountain. He had to wear a veil. By the way, I always ask this question. Can people tell you're spending time with the Lord? Yes. Does it impact the way you even like Moses, the way you even look? Yes. Does it impact the way you carry yourself? Yes. Does it impact the tone in your conversation? Some folks read their Bible, they make no application, it does not change them at all, and they walk away from that encounter unchanged. But in Moses' case, it was obvious. It was obvious he spent time with the Lord. Go back to uh, 2 Corinthians, I apologize for that wrong passage. According to this, in verses 14 and 15, the people have a veil over their eyes. It says, but their minds were blinded for until the day, this day remaineth the same veil. Untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, what the, he's talking about Moses, which veil is done away in Christ, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. So I'm saying this. Why, why don't people get saved? And the answer is, because they're spiritually blind. They, they have a veil. They have a veil over their heart where they just, just like the Jews could not see Moses' face. They are, in a sense, incapable of seeing the truth of the gospel. They have a veil over their eyes. But look at chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians. Look at verse number 4. The word of God says, in whom the God of this world, by the way, notice that's a small g there in your Bible. Small g? That's not an accident. He's talking about the God of this world. He's talking about the devil. In whom the God of this world hath blind, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I, I said it's a two-pronged issue. Number one, they have a veil over their eyes. But number two, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan has blinded their minds. Satan has blinded their minds. When they think about the gospel, when they hear of Jesus dying on the cross, when they hear that he rose from the dead, when they hear about Christians praying together, when they see Christians going as missionaries to far off lands, uh, we got a, an email from Cherith Otteson, uh, Jean. J Jean is, uh, she uh, communicates with the Otteson's about their, their needs, and she shared with us a picture of the revival that her husband, Brother Otteson, has been doing. He walked, he walked over the mountains in Papua New Guinea, 12 hours. He walked 12 hours to this revival. 800 people came to the revival. 
he had over, they saw over 50 people trust Christ for their salvation. Amen. He walked 12 hours back in the heat, in the altitude, in the mountains. Chara told my wife, he got an hour away from home and he was done. He couldn't walk another step. And they had to sit him down and let him rest. His, his helpers walked the rest of the way to his house and got food and got water and brought it back to the missionary. Isn't this a great story? <laughs> brought it back to the missionary who had poured out his heart for the people in PNG. And there they fed him and they nursed him till he could get the strength just to go another hour to go home. And unsaved people look at that and they think we're crazy. All of this sounds foolish to them. Why? Because they're blind. They can't see. They have a veil over their eyes. They've got, Satan has blinded their minds. It, it is incomprehensible to them. And that's where they are. So number two, I said number one, unbelievers are spiritually blind and it's a two-pronged issue. But the result of that, secondly under that is, the result of the spiritual blindness is they are incapable of seeing the light. They're incapable of seeing the light. Listen, you can talk about the light. You can sing about the light. Wasn't that a beautiful song? You can sing about the light. You can tell others about what the light has done for you. But you cannot make a blind man see. You can't make a blind man see. Listen, what, what's the spiritual application about that? You cannot argue people into heaven. And can I say, the most difficult, the most extreme case about that will be your loved ones. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? Raise your hand. Yeah. Your loved ones. Yeah. To the point where you'll get frustrated, almost angry. They'll say hurtful things. They'll ridicule your lifestyle. They'll mock your beliefs. But we cannot get angry when unbelievers act like unbelievers. Are you with me on that? When they say, I don't get it. Or when they say, I, I, I just don't see it. They really don't. And probably the worst thing that you and I could do is get angry or take it personally. So that leads me to my second big point. My first big point was unbelievers are spiritually blind. And so my second big point is only God can give sight to the blind. Yeah. Only God can give sight to the blind. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Look at chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I love the way this verse is worded. For God, who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness. You, 
You've heard this before. Go back to Genesis chapter number one. That phrase, it, it's just so interesting because in the beginning of the Word of God, the Word of God says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and what's that next word, class? Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Look at verse number three now. And God said, let there be light. Can I paraphrase here? And the light shined out of the darkness. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The phrase is so interesting. You just can't help but think. Go back to 2 Corinthians 4. You just can't help but think about in the beginning the darkness is such you can cut it with a knife. I've told you the story. I went to jungle training in Panama, and they had what we call a triple canopy jungle where light at night could not seep through to the point where it was utter darkness. And what I mean by utter darkness is you could wave your hand in front of your face just like this, and you would not see your hand. How many of you don't like darkness? Raise your hand. You wouldn't like that. Because honestly, I learned the hard way. That's when the creepy crawlies come out. <laughs> and to be honest with you, if I didn't know better, I believe that's where the boogie monster lived. <laughs> Utter darkness. And that's what was in Genesis 1. Are, are you listening to me? And then when you go to the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 4, spiritually speaking, that's what a lost man sees. Utter darkness. C can I say? Imagine the foolishness of someone without Christ in utter darkness trying to work their way to heaven? I mean, let, let me go back to the jungle. They had these, they're called wait a minute vines. And that's what we call them. And they had thorns that were two inches long sticking out could you imagine walking in utter darkness trying to avoid those wait a minute vines when you can't even see your hand in front of your face? I can tell you from firsthand experience, those wait a minute vines hurt pretty bad. And can you imagine a blind man walking around and all of these two-inch thorns waiting to reach out and capture him and pierce him and destroy him. How foolish would that be? Well, about as foolish as an unsaved man trying to earn his way into heaven. It, it doesn't happen. No trace of light anywhere. You can cut the darkness with a knife. And the only, the only thing that could break through, let me say it this way, the only one who could break through would be God. Amen. And that's the, same, that's the same truth for us spiritually. God, in his mercy, reaches through the darkness. Now remember, don't ever forget, God would have all men to be saved. There is, biblically speaking, I stand very strongly on the position, there is not a limited atonement. God would have all men to be saved. God in his mercy reaches through the darkness and with his great grace, he touches us and now we can respond to that touch. This week's just been so good. Hopefully, 
we understand the role of the Holy Spirit a little bit more. The Christian life that you and I live, you raised your hand saying you knew you were saved. That Christian life that you live is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not, and it cannot be, and it never will be a work of the flesh. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, the work of salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why. Our objective should be to be totally filled with and totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what's going to make the difference, not our work of the flesh. That's why we pray. That's why we even fast for our loved ones. Brother, uh, my old pastor used to tell the story of a church he went to. And he was there, and there was a house next to the church where a woman and her unsaved husband lived. And there's the church, and the woman came over to the pastor, and she said, Pastor, and I'm paraphrasing here. She said, Pastor, I just can't take it anymore. Would you let me have a room at the church where I could stay and fast and pray for my husband? And the preacher said, without a doubt. And when my former pastor went there, she was in that room fasting and praying for her husband. I know of people who have been so burdened for loved ones they could not eat. And they would pray. Out of almost a sense of desperation And I wonder, are there unsaved people you, you are that burdened for? That you would be willing to give up Freddy's? That you'd be willing to give up Chick-fil-A? All right, now, I'm going out here. That you'd be willing to give up Starbucks? It's awful quiet in here. And we fall on our face in agony. And we are reminded of the agony of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we fall on our face and we cry out to God because we know He is the only one that can change anybody. Yeah. Amen. I said, number one, unbelievers are spiritually blind. And I said, number two, only God can give sight to the blind. And that takes me to number three. We must boldly and humbly Preach the gospel to the lost. Amen. We must boldly and humbly preach the gospel to the lost. Salvation, yes, salvation is of the Lord. But according to the word of God, we have a responsibility to fill. Yeah. And let me talk about that. In chapter 4, we learn we must live with integrity so that our lives back up the message. Look at verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now look at verse number two. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We have to live our lives with integrity so that our lives back up that message that we state. I submit to you, and I've said this before, the greatest impact you can have on somebody, it's not your words, it's the impact of a changed life. 
And then as we share the gospel message, which we are mandated to do, as we share this gospel message backed up with the testimony of that changed life, people see that and the Holy Spirit of God uses that in the lives of those people. We must live with integrity. Look at verse number two. It says, uh, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. And then it says, not walking in craftiness. We don't walk in craftiness. And then it says, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. We do not need to manipulate the word of God to see people saved. Amen. Because it's not a work of the flesh. Right. How foolish would it be to say we're going to do a work of the spirit and then twist the word of God so that we can falsely convince somebody. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully. But can I say, in addition to living with integrity, look at chapter 4 and verse number 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. I said, we've got to live with integrity, but the second thing we've got to do is we we have to proclaim Christ, not us. We have to proclaim Christ and not ourselves. What, what does it mean? What does it mean to uh, preach ourselves or proclaim ourselves? It means we talk about ourselves more than we talk about Christ. It means we make it about ourselves. Uh, I heard somebody call it the me monster. We make it about our greatness. We make it about our empire. Hey, listen, we're not empire builders here at Greater Vision Baptist Church. We are not kingdom builders here. The only kingdom Greater Vision Baptist Church is building is God's kingdom. So, what happens when we do our part? Look at chapter 3. Look at verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away. In the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ, look at verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Amen. What happens when we do our part? The veil is removed. Look at verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Lost people turn to the Lord. Look again at verse number 14, but now... But their minds were blinded until the day, this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Look at the last phrase, which veil is done away. Look at those last two words. Dr. Jim talked about this, in Christ. They are now in Christ. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life, we now become ministers of the New Testament. Look at chapter 4. Look at verse number 6 in chapter 4. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of God fills their hearts. Blind eyes now see. Light begins to shine in their heart. That's what happens when we do our part. So the challenge is, will you do your part? We are dependent that God's got to do his part. And he will. Will you do your part? Will you live a life that matches up with what you say you believe? Will you do that? And will you tell others about 
what Jesus can do for them and what he's done for you? Will you do that? You know this story, but it's so good I got to tell it again. He was born in 1725. The son of an English sea captain. At the age of 11, he went to sea for the first time, and he eventually became a slave ship captain, taking black Africans to the Mediterranean and the West Indies. Forced to join the Royal Navy, he tried to desert his ship, but was flogged with 96 lashes in front of the crew. He became the slave of a white slave trader's black wife. For two years, he lived in hunger and destitution. In 1748, he boarded a ship for England, but a violent storm in the North Atlantic hit the ship, which began to fill with water. The timbers broke away from the side. An ordinary ship would have gone to the bottom immediately, but they were carrying a local of beeswax and wool, which were lighter than the water. In the midst of the struggle to save the ship, the young man said to himself, almost without thinking, if this will not do, the Lord have mercy on us. By his own testimony, it was the first desire for mercy he had felt in many years. And that was the turning point of his life. Eventually, he left the slave trade and entered the ministry in Olney, England. He soon became known as a great preacher who attracted enormous crowds. He wrote nearly 300 hymns, most of which have long since been forgotten, but some of them we still sing with how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, glorious things of thee are spoken, and amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Before he died, he prepared his own epitaph. And it reads this way, John Newton, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. God opened his eyes. In John's case, he had a faithful mother who ended up dying when he was young. But that faithful mother shared with him the story of grace. Would you, you've been challenged so much this week, I know, but I'm asking you, would you be willing to share that story of grace? What a glorious message it is, amen? Pray with me, would you? Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I asked you earlier in the message, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I asked you, if you would be willing to share the story, or if I, I asked you if you knew your sins were forgiven. And you're here today and you say, Brother Shaver, I could not raise my hand. I, I need a Savior. I need to know my sins are forgiven. I need to know that heaven's my home. Preacher, when you pray in a minute, pray for me about that. I have questions. Be my friend, preacher. Pray for me. If that's you and you don't know, I'd love to pray for you. Who's like that this morning with no one looking around? You'd slip your hand up and say, Pastor Shaver, pray for me. I don't know my sins are forgiven. I don't know heaven's my helmet. That's you, very quickly. Slip your hand up right now. Is that you? Very quickly, very quietly. How many of you would say this morning, Pastor, the Lord has even laid some people on my heart that I am committing to pray for faithfully and that as the Lord opens the door, I will share that story, that message of grace and salvation. Pastor, would you pray for me about that? If that's you, slip your hand up as well right now. God bless you. Many hands, many hands, many hands. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. You can put them down. I will pray for you. 
What a blessing it is to see people come to Christ, people that you've prayed for, people you've fasted for, people you've shared the story of salvation with. I'm going to ask you to start by coming to this altar and praying and asking God to prepare the way for you and to help you look into your own heart to make sure your own life matches up with the story that you tell. Heavenly Father, help us today, I pray. You've been so good to us. Thank you for this message that you've given us today. Lord, how timely was it, based, especially based on our revival? And Lord, you led us here. You were the one who controlled that timetable. But God, work in our hearts. Prepare the hearts of the people that you brought to our minds. But Lord, would you help us to prepare our own lives, I pray. Bless this invitation now we ask in Jesus' name with every head bowed and every eye closed. Let's stand quietly to our feet. And as you stand, the piano is going to play. And as she plays, I invite you to come. Let me share with you some exciting news. Diane Romans comes today. It's Jake's mom. And she has been coming to our church as her health's allowed her for a while. And she's come saying she'd like to unite with Greater Vision Baptist Church. If you're happy about that, say amen. amen. I've had other folks this week reach out to me saying, Pastor, we would like to join Greater Vision Baptist Church. What a blessing it is. I'm so grateful. This is a happening place. And I'm just so glad for that. Amen. God's so good. Visitors, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We don't take it lightly that you've been here. I hope you can come back. I mean that. Uh, Diane, why don't you come right down front? Jake, why don't you come stand by your mom? Will you do that? And we want to extend to her the right hand of fellowship. I told her she didn't have to say anything, but if she wanted to sing something, that was fine. She didn't take me up on that offer. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to pray. We're going to be dismissed. Hey, Ben, I love you. Worked all night, and here you are in church on Sunday morning. Ask the Lord to bless us as we go.